the Joe Rogan experience. I, I tell you an interesting story. I was when we were making that film, there was um, a point where we went down to the the IWC, the International Whaling Commission meeting down in uh, in in Chile, and we were trying to get a an interview with some of the top people there from that run the the organization because you know whales dolphins are killing them in mass and we had the footage at that point and we were just hoping to get an interview with somebody that worked for the international whaling commission and um it was i think it was going from houston to San santiago the plane was full i couldn't even sit next to the you know my my partners on the my buddies in the on the film crew there's one empty seat next to me and you know they're waiting for somebody else to come from another flight and right before the the plane door closes in comes the kira nakamai He's the head of overseas fishing for Japan, the, the head bull goose lo loony. And he sits down right next to me. I'm looking at my buddies, you know, uh, on the plane thinking, oh my God, if there is a God, you know, he has a good sense of humor. So he says, sits down next to me. And be, I didn't want, you know, him to like find out who I was and then move. So I waited till dinner was served like an hour or two later. And I said, do you have any idea who I am? He said, no. I said, I know who you are. I want to show you a film. Oh. Yeah, and so we had a we had a condensed version of it, you know, probably about twelve or fifteen minutes of it at that point, and I showed it to him, and I said, "How do you reconcile killing these sentient, intelligent animals when you know that their 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 flesh is poisoned, you know, and you're, there's recommendations for pregnant women to eat this, you know, this this flesh, uh, you know, on on the Genes uh, the Japanese Ministry of Health site." And he said, I'm not in char charge of uh, food safety. I'm in char charge of food security. In other words, he's, he doesn't have to worry about the health consequences. All he has to, uh, his job is just to provide enough meat on the plate for the, for the Japanese people. And it gives you an insight of how he's thinking. You know, he's in charge of, I think there's 145 million people in Japan in an area about the size of our California. And he says 17% of, of the, the land area in Japan is only you know, uh, good enough for growing crops on or living on, where we have to, you know, t uh, turn to the sea for food. And at that point, they were also caught skimming, stealing about 200,000 tons of endangered bluefin tuna. This is over about a 20-year period. Now, it, when you start talking about big numbers like that, I can't imagine, you know, it's hard to imagine it, but imagine like... How are they stealing this tuna? Well, they're, they, they have quotas, and they're oh. exceeding their quotas every year, and, which means that they're taken away from other countries. Right. So it's not just like they're, they're, everybody, every country has their allotment, and once you've reached it, you're supposed to go home. But the Japanese kept on getting more, so the, the Australians actually caught them, you know, they figured out over a tw this 20-year period that they went through the books and, and saw what they reported and was actually sold at the Skeezy Market, found out they, they had skimmed 200,000 tons. That's five big train cars, like trains full of, you know, endangered tuna, like not cars, but the whole trains, like 110 car trains, five of them full it's of... It's weird to r just reconcile the idea that tuna is endangered. You know, you think of tuna as being something that you just get at the store. Like tuna. Yeah. Tuna is a weird one, right? Because it's such a common food. It's in cans. You you see it at the sushi place. You know what I'm saying? Like uh, to, to, I, to I, hear that tuna is endangered. Most people are like, is tuna endangered? Like they're hearing this going, is tuna endangered? But when you talk to people that work at the fish market, they, they'll very clearly tell you that there's a radical difference between the amount of tuna that was available 30, 40 years ago versus now. To, uh, 10 years ago. I mean, we're down to bluefin tuna in particular is down to about 90, uh, it's, it's down to 4% of their historical levels. That's incredible. Yeah. And, and there's no way to stop this. There's no, I mean, it seems like it's everyone's waiting for someone else to do something. And during the meantime, everyone's just trying to make money. A lot of money. Yeah. And unfortunately, it's sort of the, what happens with endangered species. The, the more rare it becomes, the more valuable it becomes. And so there's very little incentive to do the right thing. And, you know, but this is happening with all the fish stocks. I mean, I, yeah. I, I probably gave, our, my, my, I run a little organization called the Oceanic Preservation Society, and I probably gave out more seafood guides than anybody on the planet. This is the Monterey sea, Seafood, you know, got watches, like, mm -hmm. like what, what fish are sustainable? And I've seen them, you know, go through the fish stocks, so less and less, you know, we, we start at the big animals, and we start to, you know, slowly go through all the fish stocks until, like, we're, you know, like McDonald's used to do halibut. Now it's Pollock, which is a very small, you know, uh, white fish from Alaska. 
and now that's being you know had to extinction. So we're going through these fish stocks. It's you know that shifting baseline where you're seeing you know each successive generation adapts to the diminishment of the, the previous one. That's what, what's going on. So I just stopped you know handing out seafood guides, and now I'm trying to sort of preempt it. So I don't think you know the big question is. There's seven and a half billion of us on this planet, soon to be 10. Is there enough wild animals to, to feed us all? There isn't. You know, you look at the biomass of mammals on the planet, you know, between livestock and humans, we we're, we occupy 90, 96% of the biomass of mammals on the planet. 4% are wild mammals. And then, you know, so we can't all be eating wild fish. You know, we and think about that. You know, you never go out and say, look, let's get some land food. Mm-hmm. You say, you know, we, right. we, seafood, div- right. we, we've commodified, you know, sea animals. That is interesting, right? You don't say land food. Yeah. That's a really good point. You know, they did at the turn of the century. I mean, uh, during the uh, late 1800s, rather, there was market hunting in North America. And a lot of the soldiers were done with world with um, the Civil War, rather. They were hunting, and they, they hunted all the deer, the bear, the antelope, the buffalo, and they got down to, like, incredible low numbers you know elk to this day i think are only in 10 percent of their original range that that they were at in the 1700s and that was all from market hunting from people just going out buying you know meat from these uh, market hunters that have shot these things and they didn't really have refrigeration back then so it wasn't like they could freeze it and store it and uh, they got down to these incredibly low levels until Teddy Roosevelt and a lot of other people that were conservation minded realized like what was happening here and they put a stop to it all and then started uh, enacting programs to reintroduce these animals to the the areas where they're extirpated. And now you see historic levels of uh, especially white tailed deer. There's more white tailed deer in America now than were when Columbus landed. Wow. So it's uh, but there's, that's been success. But it's also that's a weird one too because white tailed deer are almost a farm animal. Because there's so many of them that exist in Iowa and Kansas and around farmlands. Like they literally exist in fields and a lot of them live off of GMO crops. So it's very strange. So mm-hmm. like I have a, a buddy of mine, my friend uh, Doug, Doug Duran, who has this uh, huge uh, piece of land in Wisconsin. And he's like, the deer in my area are essentially eating these GMO corn. They're eating Monsanto corn. Like, this is so weird. Like, they, yeah, they're wild, but they're also kind of farm animals, you know, because they – and they exist in record numbers because they've got so much food to eat. And no predators. Yeah, I mean, the only predators they have there – I mean, they, they have some wolves now, very few in some, some parts of the driftless area in Wisconsin. I think they have – they have some bears too, and coyotes. A lot of coyotes that will uh, kill a lot of the fawns. I lived in Boulder, Colorado, for a while, and we had a, a lot of bears and mountain lions come through our mm. our, our yard because we were right at the base of the foothills of the, the Rockies. And a neighbor, I woke up one morning. The neighbor was like looking at his his minivan, and there's a big dent in the side, and he's trying to figure out like how to get a dent because it was parked here all night, and he found a an antler in the bushes. Oh. And we thought, well, what the hell? How do, how do, and then the question is, how does a deer run into it? And then in the paper the next day, there was a picture of a mountain lion on a house down the block, sitting on a hot tub cover. This is in the winter, holding a deer with one, you know, in his mouth with one antler. Oh, so it attacked <laughs> it and slammed it into. Oh, Jesus Christ! I lost a dog in Boulder to a mountain lion. Wow. Yeah, I had a little dog who was part uh, American Eskimo and pa- part Pomeranian. Mountain lion got it. Uh, the mountain lion, I think, got our cat. Yeah, they get everything up there, man. If it's not them, it's a fox. You know, there's a lot of foxes up there to get things. But God, it's beautiful. Yeah, no, Boulder's it's gorgeous. incredible, incredible place. And you'll be driving down the road, and you see it's weird. Like the deer in Boulder know that they're safe. So like we were we were uh, looking at this house in in Boulder, and we opened up the door to the backyard, and there was this enormous deer just standing there staring at us and my wife thought it was fake i go no that's a real deer she's like what and then it just turns its head and starts moving around because it wasn't even remotely freaked out that there were people a, th- a stone's throw away from it yeah. they're just so used to being around people it's weird yeah the neighbor i remember the neighbor of ours planting rose bushes on the front of their property and you know all proud and then i remember I was driving home like later on that day and there's such a deer coming to just snipping the tops of the roses oh, just going like it. a salad bar yeah, m- many people have turned on deer because of the loss of their gardens, the roses especially. They love roses. Yeah, it's um, 
I do, is there anybody that has ever come up with any sort of a plan to do what they did for wild animals in North America? Because it, but I see, you can't regulate it the way you can wild animals. Because in wild animals, if they have a particular area, you could make it so people can't go in that area. But the ocean is so enormous. Like, how has anybody come up with some sort of a, a repopulation plan? Sure, sure. There's a. Uh, E.O. Wilson, I'm on the board of uh, the advisory board of his his group. It's called the, the you know the half the Half Life Project. Um, you know who E.O. Wilson is? No. Okay. E.O. Wilson is a Harvard professor. Um, has two Pulitzers for his work on in biology. He's a um, wrote the book on biodiversity. He's considered the father of modern um, biodiversity. He's about um, getting right around 90 years old now. But uh, looking at he, he would do things like go to an island and then pretty much exterminate everything on it and then try to figure out, well, w w you know, at what rate do the animals come back and what's, what's sustainable. And he's figured out that to save 85% of the, 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 you know, the wild animals on the planet, you have to put aside half of it for them. You know, that's half of called, the planet. Half the planet. Yeah. So and, the ocean, you would have to literally make half the ocean where people couldn't travel in it? Um, not travel and it just not exploit it, you know. No through, fishing. Yeah, no fishing. Yeah. And so, so Sylvia Earle is working on hot spots. You know these. Uh, um, they're they're called. You know, I think what she, what she calls it's like a like a, like blue zones where, um, you know, you have a lot of biodiversity. You know, try to keep those uh, away from fishing uh, exp exploitation. How do they do that though? Like how? I mean. It's, uh, you would have to get everybody on board, right? Yeah, well, the, the high seas are, you know, that's that's tough, right? Yeah. Well, the, you know, the Japanese were fishing in a, you know, in an international marine sanctuary for decades, you know, so you have to, you, you know, it's really tough when you have um, organizations that really don't have any teeth to it. It's th that, the, the attitude that he has, that pragmatic attitude about feeding the population, you almost can sympathize with him, right? I mean, a hundred plus million people in this tiny place the size of California and just pulling mostly fish out of the ocean. I mean, it's, uh, it's a crazy place to be in terms of his, his position. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't envy it at all. Um, but, you know... What, what do you do? You some, don't some, slaughter dolphins. That's yeah. what you do. Yeah. yeah. Well, we're endangered species. Yeah. Or, I mean, I, I don't know what's, um, you know, what's sustainable anymore. I mean, is it, it possible? To, I mean, I know they've done this in in some places outside of Hawaii, where they've uh, they've bred animals, uh, fish rather, like sushi fish, like hamachi, and they've had these pens set up, and then a lot of times uh, a storm will come by like a huge storm and they break these pens and then those fish get wild then people start catching them. Yeah, well that's I mean like like salmon like well you know yeah. I, I went they were trying to in Japan when we were doing the cove we were, went to a, a university where they were breeding the first bluefin tuna these are from eggs you know so this is when like like what they do at some places where they they they, they catch them then they put them in these pens and they fatten them up these were they're, they're make, making bluefin from scratch basically from mm -hmm. eggs. And really hard to do, really skittish. And when I went there, they were shoveling. This uh, this is back when I ate fish. Um, they were shoveling these mackerels, like what I would feed my family with, like a family of four. They were shoveling it to the tuna. And I said, "Hold on a minute. Like, how many? How many? How much? You know, mackerel does it take to make a pound of tuna?" They said, "Oh, about seven, for up until about 150 pounds. And after that, it takes 14 pounds." So seven pounds of wild fish to make one pound of farm-raised fish. I mean, this is like going Whoa. to the bank and, you know, because you, know, you want a crisp $5 bill and say, Let, you know, give me a, uh, you know, here's a couple, a couple 20s. Wow. But that's, you know, if you look at, you know, what are they feeding, you know, a lot of these fish, they're feeding them, you know, fish. parts of farm animals and yeah. fish, wild fish. Wow. And I was just reading this morning of uh, Los Angeles Magazine that uh, – <laughs> And the cover it says, you know, fish fish are fucked, and it has a, uh, and it, it talks about like the fish that are raised, and I, I don't know the data behind it, but they they have eight times more pollutants in it than wild fish. Right. Um, I don't know if it's what they're feeding, or maybe because they're sitting in a. They're you know, stationary. I think yeah. that's a big part of the problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah, and apparently they don't taste as well. But when we were uh, in Hawaii recently, um, we went scuba diving and uh, you know snorkeling. So you jump off the boat and you're swimming around. And you know what's really fucking weird about that is how few fish there are. Like when you're under there, you're like you expect you're gonna dunk your head underwater with those goggles on. You're gonna see all this wildlife, all these fish swimming around. It's no, it's not much. You yeah, don't, you don't I, see much. Yeah, there was a, a about uh, ten years ago. I was down in the Caribbean. A friend was getting married, and I took his daughter out to. You know, I, I didn't know it at the time, but it was her first time snorkeling, and we were in an area that I'd been to about 20 years before and there was nothing there was nothing there it was just like a desert yeah and then i heard her screaming through a snorkel and i thought what, what what's wrong and she was screaming because she saw a single orange tang that was the only life form we saw there where we, i used to see clouds of schools of these you yeah. know orange and blue tang now there was nothing and i thought my god she thinks that that's beautiful and it mm. is it's just you know the single fish but you know Again, that shifting baseline, the generation before when I was there, it was probably looked like the land before time. Right. These places I went to with, with Clark, you know, Raja Anpat, where you'd see, th you know, if you go to the Caribbean, you might see 30 fish on a different species of fish on a dive. And, and Raja Anpat, you'd see 300. And it was just miraculous. And when you're taking pictures, you actually see more detail with the picture than you can with your, your, your eye can't comprehend it all. So it's only when you get back and you see these reefs that we, you know, we lit like jewel boxes, mm. you see how much life that there is there, but there was just uh, unbelievable stunning amounts of, of wildlife, but that's going on all over the world. And the great barrier reef, you know, we lost over half the great barrier reef in the last two years. It was never that good anyway. You know, 15 years ago, I, you know, after being to these some of the best preserved places in the world that I've been to with Clark, we looked at the Great Barrier Reef and we'd be like, oh my God, this is not that great. And now they've already, then they've lost half again. So, I mean, if you're just the, putting your head in the water for the first time and you come from, you know, Iowa or Wisconsin or Boulder, that looks pretty good. But if you knew what came before that, you're, you're seeing this, this you know, assault against, you know, nature going on. <laughs>